Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to AEI. My name is Ryan Streeter. I'm the Director of Domestic Policy Studies here at the American Enterprise Institute, and it's uh, my privilege to, to welcome you to today's event, What Happened to Compassionate Conservatism and Can It Return? Um, we're honored to be joined by Dr. Marvin Olasky today, who's going to come up and give some remarks, and then uh, after his remarks, we'll have a panel discussion and then open it up for question and answer, and we'll, we'll um, adjourn at 1.30 p.m. Um, Dr. Marvin Olasky is the editor-in-chief of World Magazine, uh, and he's also the Distinguished Chair in Journalism and Public Policy at Patrick Henry College. Um, for nearly 25 years, from the early 1980s until 2007, he was a professor of journalism at the University of Texas at Austin, um, which delights me since I was at UT Austin before coming to AEI. Hook em horns. I don't know if, if you still 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 good to do. He was also a visiting professor at Princeton from 2004 to 2005, and then the provost at the King's College in New York City from 2007 to 2011. Dr. Olasky has authored many books and many articles, um, which you can find uh, just by Googling it, so look, look it up. His articles range across uh, a, a whole bunch of topics, from history to public policy to the relationship between faith and culture. Uh, he's been very prolific. I'd like to draw your attention to two today. Um, that are pertinent to today's discussion, The Tragedy of American Compassion, which I suspect a number of you have read, and Compassionate Conservatism. Now, these books played a significant role in the welfare reform debate of the 1990s and the overall debate about the role of non-governmental actors in combating poverty. Um, because of these books and Dr. Olasky's related uh, efforts, President George W. Bush called Marvin, quote, Compassionate Conservatism's leading thinker. So we're honored today to have Compassionate Conservatism's leading thinker with us, Dr. Marvin Olasky. Well, thank you, Ryan, for those kind words. Thank you all for coming. In the next 20 minutes, I want to offer five understandings that defined Compassionate Conservatism in the 1990s. And then I'll give you five promising events and trends from the late 1990s. And then five problems that killed compassionate conservatism in the early 2000s. I'll conclude by noting what it will take, maybe, to revive it. But I want to start with a tribute to one mostly forgotten Washingtonian. When thinking about an abstract subject, it's often good to keep a particular person in mind. So I want to tell you about the greatest poverty fighting person I ever knew. Anna Hawkins. For 30 years, starting in 1985, she ran Children of Mine, a program in Anacostia about five miles southeast of here. You know, that's the part of, that's the part of the tourist guides forget. And I visited there over a couple of decades, and this short African-American woman taught me to look beneath the surface of glowing programs. On one visit, she had just come back from a government-sponsored meeting about Southeast Washington revitalization, and she fumed. The beautiful people were there looking for money. Just like the war on poverty, money went into the pockets of the greedy. Those folks are ready to clean up unless stuff gets funky, and they call me in to be the cleanup person. The, the old building that housed children of mine was crowded. The roof sometimes leaked. They, a realistic soundtrack for her program would have some police sirens in the background, a lot of chattering kids, occasionally gunshots. But Hannah scowled. She scowled about the opportunities to send kids to nice facilities. She'd get invitations for them to show up on days when officials were visiting nonprofits. And those charity managers wanted to create an illusion of vibrant activity. So why did children flock to her when she, she commanded them? Wash those dirty hands. You know, I watched her tell a, a kid just becoming a teenager, your armpits stink. Wash them before you come tomorrow. And the boy meekly said, yes, ma'am. Why? I mean, he and others obeyed because most of the adults they knew were selfish, but Ms. Hawkins wanted what was best for them. She said, I ain't easy to deal with, but my children know I love and care about them. And she said, I'm trying to bring them from disgrace to grace. She gave them maxims such as stay on the street called straight, or people who pick fights end up dead or in jail. And she would not accept any government money because she said, then I won't be able to have prayer. 
And she said once she agreed to accept federally supplied meals, but uh, the milk was warm, the tacos were cold, and the watermelon was sour. So Hannah, um, a handful of volunteers, some donors, made it possible for her to lead Bible studies, tutor kids, give them grammar lessons along with meals. I mean, she would say, I need one person to tell me what a verb is. Money was tight. She hated waste. She told of official anger when she didn't give milk to children who didn't want milk. She says, they said I didn't give the children complete meals. I said I wanted to teach the children not to waste. And she scorned the response she got from the officials. Give it to them anyway. Give them a complete meal. Let them throw it in the trash. I could go on, but you get the picture. Uh, three years ago, Hannah Hawkins died of cancer. And the point of everything I think I've written about poverty fighting is to help the hundreds of almost Hannahs that I've met around the country. I, I agree with Hannah about the billions of dollars we waste by providing stuff that's thrown into the trash. Uh, but more importantly, dozens of federal programs encourage people to throw their own lives into the trash. So here are the five understandings that were crucial to the growth of compassionate conservative approaches in the early and mid-1990s. Number one, people are poor for a variety of reasons. Some are structural, bad schools, deindustrializing economy, racism. Some are personal, drug or alcohol use, mental illness, uh, a blame others worldview, unwillingness to work. Anyone who tells you it's all one or all the other is blowing smoke. Two, government can be efficient in sending out checks. Social Security is a pretty good example. Government does a poor job in dealing with personal problems. That's partly because of bureaucracy. It's also because those personal problems involve values, and values come from religion. We rightly worry about government proposing or opposing particular religious views. Three, it's, it's good to honor points of light, but here's what I learned from American history. Charity groups based in religious understandings have been, can be, more than points. In the past, they have illuminated every city with charity that was challenging, personal, and spiritual. There are a bunch of conventional, conventional histories of poverty fighting which tend to disparage those efforts. But what I learned from a year in the Library of Congress, just going through all the old records, they were more effective than recent governmental programs in helping people climb out of poverty. Now, four, the Depression did overwhelm some of those charities. And the federal government then set up parallel secular programs over time, those became big bureaucracies that grew and sustained themselves by enabling people to remain poor. With a steady income from taxpayers, they crowded out organizations relying on contributions. Many people saw no need to volunteer. Professional social workers were taking care of problems, but with growing caseloads, those social workers will say, and they understand that they mainly shuffle paper. And then five, more reliable funding for charity groups should not depend, in my view, on getting more grants from Washington for two reasons. First, officials are not the best judges of what works and what doesn't work. We need to empower people with intimate knowledge of the programs. And then second, insofar as many of the most effective groups are religious, governmental involvement is inherently a problem. So those are the five understandings that I developed from this historical research. And then suddenly, after Republicans in 94, the election, then 1995, they suddenly have a majority of the House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. So it's possible at that point to turn the historical and sociological understandings I was developing into public policy. So I thought, here are five things that happened. Okay, first, Republicans transformed, transformed one big program by turning AFTC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, into TANF. Temporary aid to needy families. And temporary meant establishing time limits. Needy meant creating work requirements for those who could work and concentrating aid on those who could not. Congress passed that reform measure actually three times, and finally Bill Clinton reluctantly signed it into law. Second, Bill Clinton also signed into law what became known as charitable choice. And that said religious organizations are eligible for federal grants as long as those grants do not subsidize religious activities in any way. 
I wasn't really thrilled with that legislation because I, I naively thought that religious organizations were supposed to be religious. Third, here was a better proposal, I thought, uh, from J.C. Watts and Jim Talent, both representatives. They introduced an American Community Renewal Act called ACRA that would have, among other things, given individual taxpayers a tax credit of 75 cents for every dollar they contributed to local poverty fighting organizations, up to a, a modest $200 starting out, and then maybe if it worked, it would increase. I liked ACRA because those who claimed the tax credit would have to volunteer personally with the charity. And in doing so, they would develop a greater sense of ownership in solving local problems. Uh, Dan Coates, when he was a senator, introduced a similar bill, produced, uh, proposed a tax credit for contributions up to $1,000 for taxpayers filing jointly. Those measures did not succeed for a whole lot of reasons. One argument against them at that time was that itemizers would merely switch their donations to the more powerful tax credit column. Fourth, there were some really good things happening at the local level. Mayor Steve Goldsmith, Indianapolis, provided, I thought, the best examples. I visited there, spent some time. He set up a front porch alliance that helped community groups overcome governmental barriers. I'll give you an example. A church wanted to turn a patch of ground adjacent to it into a playground. Prostitutes used it. Drug dealers used it. The church needed help with the legal complexities to try to turn that into a playground that kids from all over would use, and the city provided that help. There were all several dozen organizations that had to sign off on that particular patch of ground. The city people helped them go through it all, got it done, and lo and behold, that place of drug dealing and prostitution became a playground for kids. And then five, good things happened in some states. And I'll tell you a, I'll tell you a story about how George W. Bush became involved in this. In 1995, there was an Austin bureaucracy called the Texas Commission on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, Takata. It tried to shut down Teen Challenge of South Texas. The problem, according to Takata, was the Teen Challenge counselors had not sat in classrooms for 78 hours of formal, formal counselor training. They didn't deny that they were doing an effective job, but they hadn't gone through the, the hoops. It didn't matter that Teen Challenge on a shoestring was more effective in helping people get out of drugs and, and alcohol than government programs that per person cost more than a year at Harvard or Yale. Uh, Bob Woodson, the former AI fellow who turns 81 next week, I mean, talk about another great poverty fighter, Bob set up a rally for Teen Challenge at the Alamo, you know, with great Texas significance. And the, the people there held up two kinds of signs, I remember. One was saying, this program saves the taxpayers of Texas $30,000 a year per person at that time. And the other one said, Thank you, Lord Jesus, for bringing me out of alcoholism or drugs. So pub public policy signs, religious signs. Uh, I wrote about Takata versus Team Challenge in the magazine I edit, World. I asked readers, this is about the only time I think I've done that, I asked readers, send your cards and letters to the governor's mansion in Austin, gave them the address, and they did. And then I wrote a column in the Wall Street Journal, and more of them did, messages piled up. And then there was a call from the governor's office. Uh, could I come over and explain what was going on? So I went and had lunch with W, um, and maybe because of his own battle with alcohol, he got it right away. He supported Teen Challenge. He then supported bills that the Texas legislature passed to keep the bureaucrats off the backs of other groups. That, for me, was compassionate conservatism. Uh, conservative, liberate what Edmund Burke called the little platoons, what Alexis de Tocqueville called America's volunteer spirit. In 1999, I had some minor involvement with the speech W gave in Indianapolis. The Washington Post called it, quote, the most elaborate definition to date of his compassionate conservative credo, end quote. And I mention that because the Post accurately summarized the main point of the speech, quote, Bush said he would dedicate $8 billion for tax incentives to encourage people to contribute to charities and community groups, end quote. Okay, this was great exactly what I've been pushing for, decentralized compassionate conservatism. Uh, Steve Goldsmith, Indianapolis mayor, was Bush's top domestic policy advisor during the presidential campaign. And Steve was a bottom-up, uh, little platoons guy. So I felt confident that W would be able to stick with what he had proclaimed. Well, then in 2001, here are five surprises that intervened. I'll tell you what I believe happened, but I haven't gone back to interview the principal players, and I I would like to do that when I get some time. 
In the meantime, I'll, I'm glad to be corrected by any of you who know more about what happened, because some of this is still a mystery to me. But here's what happened first. Early in 2001, Steve Goldsmith lost favor with some key Bush staffers, and maybe Bush himself. I don't know. I've heard gossip. I don't know why. Suddenly, John DiIulio, a smart professor who had been advisor, had been advisor to Al Gore, gained the nod as head of the new Office on Faith-Based and Community Initiatives. That made sense politically. W was president-elect without a mandate. You know, it took five weeks for him to actually get the, get the call finally from the Supreme Court. So reaching out to Democrats like John was important. And then some people that looked at the faith-based initiative as a Bush attempt to get federal dollars to evangelical churches, so appointment of John, a Catholic, undercut that speculation. Plus, John is smart, John is funny, he's a good guy, but the appointment had a big downside. John was not at all a decentralizer. He thought federal grant making in the poverty area had been poorly handled, he was absolutely right there. He wanted to do a much better job evaluating programs. He did not favor charity tax credits or other decentralizing approaches. And the second surprise, which followed naturally from the first, the Bush administration, contrary to what W had said in 1999, de-emphasized tax credits. It stuck with a centralized grant approach. That did not promote the little platoons. It quickly became a political mistake as well. Once John emphasized grant making, the controversial question of eligibility came to the fore. Should federal money go to groups that had Bible study and prayer as integral parts of their programs? On the other hand, if they stopped doing that, then they felt, and I think rightly, like a ship that was trying to go without an engine. So that didn't work. So John first said, no, they can't do this. They can't have the word this stuff, and evangelicals rebelled. I heard that Carl Rove forced John to reverse his position. But then when evangelical groups were eligible, all lots of others, atheist, agnostic, liberal, Protestant, some Catholics rebelled. See, the political charm of tax credits, which I think is why Carl Rove initially thought this was a cool idea, is that individuals make the decision. When grant making is centralized, dad makes the decision. And I've, I have four sons, and I learned from hard experience that uh, one of the children is highly likely to say it's not fair. And that's what happened here. So third, once the Bush administration stuck with centralization, the key question for the press was, how much money are you spending? When the total amount of grant money did not explode, reporters declared compassionate conservatism to be a political hoax. And when some, when some organization did announce a new grant, the issue was, well, who's in and who's out? So part of the tragedy here is that tax credits could have been a, bi a bipartisan push. Uh, Mark Souter, who's one of my favorite conservative Republicans back then, told me that two liberal Democrats, Bobby Scott and Chet Edwards, were willing to co-sponsor a bill to that effect. It never happened. Instead, from what I'm told, Bush administration folks asked Mark Souter to stand down. This is what he told me, and he did. And the reason, I'm told, is that in 2001, a balanced budget seemed like a big thing. You know, we are, we are much more sophisticated now. Uh, Bush folks chose between two items, I'm told, that would cut government revenue. One, established tax reform, uh, established est estate, estate tax reform, uh, or two, have charity tax credits. Well, if a Republican administration has to choose between those two items, guess which is likely to interest big political donors? So estate tax reform went in, charity tax credits were out. Um, now, fourth, once the faith-based office emphasized grant making, bureaucratic organizations that knew how to push paper had a big advantage. And since the idea of helping the little guy still remained, guess what emerged as the big way to help them? Yep, teach local leaders how to apply for grants. And that flipped compassionate conservatism on its head. Instead of fighting bureaucracy, it was building bureaucracy. And fifth, when John DiIulio resigned at the end of August 2001, the possibility of writing the program remained, but a week and a half later came 9-11. And by the way, I have, here's an article I actually wrote in August of 2001 the Washington game, a move-by-move -move account of how a weakened faith-based initiative bill passed the House, which it did, but then it died in the Senate and with 9-11 with was all over. I have copies of this for everyone right there in the front row, and if you're interested in the blow-by-blow -blow at that time and how this actually worked politically as best I could do at that point from 
interviewing lots of people, take one of those along, read it, and, and weep. Uh, George W. Bush moved from being a domestic-oriented president emphasizing compassion to a war president emphasizing fighting back. That's what he had to do. War and compassion don't go together well. War is hell. War is also expensive. Democratic lawmakers then as now wanted more money for social spending. To get money for war, Bush increased money for welfare. And many Republicans came to equate compassionate conservatism with more government spending. Compassionate conservatism equals big government. Compassionate conservatism is a left-wing thing, fooey on compassionate conservatism. Well, I also want to say that it wasn't all over with 9-11. It mostly was John's successors tried some decentralization within the grants approach. They had far better judgment than their predecessors. They tried some voucher programs. I need to learn more about this period, but the basic problem was that Washington still controlled the money. The basic structure remained, but with increased spending. So finally, can compassionate conservatives make a comeback? I don't think it will ever under that name. That brand, I guess, to use that word, has been spoiled. But the essence of it may. And on one public policy question, we have a splendid opportunity right now. Remember, one critique of a poverty-fighting tax credit in the 1990s was that the federal government was already promoting charitable giving with tax deduction incentives. And those led about 30% of Americans to itemize taxes. Now, the tax experts say that with the recent tax reform, by doubling the standard deduction, well, that will reduce the percentage of those who use the itemized deduction from about 30% to about 5%. And that diminishes fear that a tax credit would merely lead people to shift money from one given category to another. So if we actually want to try to do something decentralizing now, the opportunity, I think, is there. Uh, if Republicans particularly are willing to, to push it and not just try to play grants our way, but try to decentralize and trust, trust the little platoons. And the larger question, bigger than the public policy question, I have to say, is whether millions of Americans have the will to follow the example of the great Hannah Hawkins. In World Every Year, we hand out hope awards for effective compassion. And so my reporters and I have seen thousands of volunteers sacrificing for others, but we need millions. Uh, compassion like that doesn't come naturally. The Hannahs of the world love others because God first loved them. The current trend toward declining religious involvement, I suspect, also means declining compassion. But one thing I think is clear fiscally and socially, if we continue on our present welfare-expanding path, we are heading for a crack-up. We need a new reformation. God only knows whether we'll have one. Thanks very much. Well, I'm interested in reactions. Uh, in what order? I guess, Ryan, start with you. I mean, you, you know a lot more about what happened in those early 2000s than I do, so. Okay, well, thanks for your remarks, and um, um, I'll just make a couple of points and then turn it over to my distinguished uh, co-panelists who know a lot more about the, the substance of the, the, the underlying issues than I do, but um, I, I would just piggyback off of what you said about the environment in the Bush White House early on. I was there. Um, as a staffer, um, a, a domestic policy staffer, and worked for a time in, in the office that, that was set up to implement the initiative. And, um, and I think that historical context is important, and not, not just for, for the Bush administration, but even the run-up to it in the 1990s. For, for if, if part of the goal is to figure out how we can recover um, some of the, the conditions that led to uh, what became compassionate conservatism, I think it's important to understand that, that environment. So I'll come to that in just a second. But um, my experience, and this is a little impressionistic, is that in the, the early days of the Bush 
administration's effort to implement this, you had a couple of camps involved in this initiative, which had a White House office, uh, a relationship with the Domestic Policy Council, and then had offices first in five, then, then seven federal agencies, uh, whose job it was to implement the, the president's goals. And um, I came to, and this is just my, my terminology from the, the time that I used to use, I, I talked about the reformers and the missionaries that were part of the initi initiative. Um, there were some of us, I considered myself part of the reformers set. I'd worked for Steve Goldsmith in Indianapolis and, and thought of the, uh, the, the goals of the faith-based and community initiative as reforming public policy uh, around the assets of local community-based, values-based organizations. That is, y using what is sort of latently strong about their approach to fighting poverty and then figuring out what that means for public policy. And I'll give you some examples in just a second. Then, then I would say that the, the initiative as it was staffed up also had what I referred to as missionaries, people that just really wanted to pursue the inclusivity goals of, of the initiative as getting more faith-based, community-based groups involved in uh, applying for federal grants, involved in federal programs. I would say what sort of united those two groups was probably the charitable choice sort of um, aftermath, which was to try to rewrite federal rules to comply with First Amendment jurisprudence about church and state relations that um, had gone, had swung too far to the direction of excluding uh, religious organizations from the provision of services. And, and so I'd say both camps were united in, in rewriting the rules, which was done uh, through the public rulemaking process to make it easier for smaller um, values-based and religious-based organizations to participate. But the, the what I called the missionary crowd were those who really focused, who really wanted to focus the initiative on getting as many religious organizations involved in federal programs as, as possible, which flows from some of John's, uh, Dulio's efforts and, and others, and really came to sort of define the initiative uh, overall. Um, but there was this period of time, you know, from the beginning of the administration up through 2003, 2004, where some of those early policy reforms were still pursued. Uh, in kind of an individualistic way. And I can do this more by way of anecdote. I remember sitting in, in my office in 2002, in the fall of 2002, um, with the late David Quo, uh, and we got a call um, from the president's chief of staff. The president, in the fall, at the White House is when you're preparing the budget and the State of the Union and, and all the things you're going to propose in the following year. And um, uh, we were in, oh, I should say, this is the fall of 2002 as well. So this is a year after 9 11. To give us some context, um, it, that, that had happened, that was still fresh in everyone's mind, it had really changed the nature of the presidency. There weren't a lot of people thinking uh, very close to the president about the, the commitments made uh, around the, the faith-based and community initiative. It had really kind of fallen into the, to the background, and those of us who were working on it understood, understood why. It was also the fall of 2002, which meant the D.C. shooter was rampant right. <laughs> for those who were here back then. We'd had anthrax. We had the D.C. shooter. My wife was putting our two small children in the back of our car and driving down and picking me up every day so I wouldn't walk the five blocks home from the, the metro um, because of the D.C. shooter that we never knew when, when he was going to strike next. And so that was the environment. So it, it seemed like everybody had really forgotten about the needs of, of this initiative. But the chief of staff calls and said the president's been reviewing his briefing papers on what's going to go into the budget and what's going to go into the State of the Union. And he said it feels a little light on the compassion agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and so we pulled off the shelf this book, which all of us staffers had. And when I showed my students when I used to teach uh, at the university that, that campaigns actually used to produce things like this with like actual like policy substance, they're shocked yeah. that yeah. campaigns actually did this. But um, we had... Um, there's a lot of the compassion agenda through here, but starting on page 119, right after his duty of hope speech, which really laid out his agenda in July of 1999, when you were very involved in, in shaping uh, then Governor Bush's thinking, um, he gave a speech about what his vision for using the armies of compassion to actually fight poverty and cure social ills would look like. And then after every speech, there would be uh, fact sheets with a number of policy proposals. It goes on for 12 pages, uh, including the charitable tax credit you talked about, but other types of things. One of which was um, to provide uh, more drug treatment options for people that were seeking treatment and couldn't um, find it. And so that night we sat down and drafted what became essentially the, the beginnings of the Access to Recovery Program administered by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which would open up treatment options um, to faith-based providers and, and the like, which was, again, proposed in here. And vouchers. Um, in vouchers. And voucherized so that you could utilize um, these resources at a wider range of service providers than were uh, presently allowed during, during that time. Um, the next year, the Department of Labor 
um, put into place uh, Ready for Work, which is a prisoner reentry program, which was a, uh, initially 11, I think grew to 20 pilot sites to really focus on the role of community-based organizations in, re in fighting recidivism. Um, so you had these things going on. At the same time, I would say the general trend of the initiative was, was toward um, inclusivity of faith-based groups in federal programs rather than changing federal programs um, to, to fit the behavior and needs of, of local um, armies of compassion actors. So I think the, the, the diagnosis that you have is generally, generally right. It was, it was uh, a movement that had um, some reform elements uh, that sort of got overtaken, particularly after the 2004 re-election by this broader effort to, to include groups in, um, in federal programs and really led to an environment in which the idea that uh, local actors could actually change the way um, federal programs behaved uh, had sort of been been lost for for a variety of reasons, some of which you articulated, and some of which many of us may not understand. So I think it's worth backing up from there and, and, and realizing that the conditions leading up to this um, this initiative of the Bush administration was they was really birthed in the 1990s, and it's a it, it, that I, I often refer to the 1990s as the decade of the mayor. It was a really interesting time in, in American public policy, particularly urban policy. You had uh, Rudolph, you had Rudy Giuliani in New York, you had Goldsmith in Indianapolis, John Norquist in Milwaukee, you had Rendell in Philadelphia, Susan Golding in, in San Diego, and, and this was the age of welfare reform. Uh, community policing, the beginnings of, sco of school choice and school reform, um, Hope 6, which uh, took a, an approach to public housing to dismantle it and voucherize, create mixed income housing. It was a, all of these efforts um, really were focused on the idea that communities take ownership for solving problems in, in distinct ways, po problems related to poverty, crime, education, and so on. And this, these efforts that were, were happening, in, happening in the urban policy domain were set against the backdrop of a, a lot of activity focused on uh, the, what we called the armies of compassion in the Bush years, which is really the institutions, the core mediating structures of civil society. Um, there was a book uh, at, by AEI Press, um, by Berger and Newhouse, uh, first published in 1976 mm -hmm. and then republished by AEI later called To Empower People, which some of you may have read. It's a great read. It's very influential on me and a lot of us working in in, in domestic policy back in the 1990s. Um, if you go to the, the Amazon page for To Empower People, the first sentence says that Berger and Newhouse, uh, when they wrote this, anticipated, this is a quote from Amazon, anticipated the major worldwide project of the 1990s, the renewal of civil society. <laughs> they showed that such mediating structures as family, neighborhood, church, and voluntary and civil associations are crucial institutions. Uh, and when, they, uh, when we weaken them, it spells disaster. So this book was influential. This, the 1990s also became the, the decade when Bob Putnam's very famous work on social capital was underway. And it was, all, these things together created a, a sense among policymakers that if we're going to successfully combat poverty, if we're going to improve our schools, uh, if we're going to uh, help kids grow up in, in healthy homes, you can't do this unless you take the lead from community leaders. And this, this overlapping kind of Venn diagram of nonprofit leaders, business leaders, and government actors. And this, this really is, is best achieved at the local level. I also point out that uh, the welfare reform that Marvin referred to in 1996 was prefaced by um, 10 years and more of governors experimenting with welfare reform, seeking waivers from federal policy. And if you're going to successfully reform welfare and particularly uh, re require people to work or expect them to be engaged in looking for work, you can't do that unless those people are connected with people who can help them along the way, with business leaders, with nonprofit leaders, and the like. So by the time that welfare reform rolled around in 1996, um, you had a lot of effort already going on at the state level that presupposed the importance of community institutions. So I, I would just, uh, uh, we can talk more about what to do going forward after, after I've turned the, over the floor. I've already taken too much time, but I, I would just point out um, something that I think is, is illustrative. If you go back to um, 1994 and you look at the contract um, with America that, that was the, led the Republican Revolution in 1994, and I'm, I'm making this not as a, as a partisan statement, but to show a change over time. If you go back and pull that contract with America document and you just read it, um, there are 10 bills that eventually came from it and presupposed in a good number of those bills are the importance of neighborhoods, strong families, schools, uh, work, and community-based support for people who are going to work from, from welfare. Um, if you fast forward to the 2010 Tea Party um, election and you look at the campaign rhetoric and the campaign pages of the people that, again, another huge wave of Republican policymakers, that language is almost completely devoid uh, from their campaign platforms, from the websites that they put up and all of that. It was really uh, kind of an anti-spending. It was a reactionary movement about what was going on in the Obama administration at the time, but the vision 
for how to reform government had almost nothing to do with localities. And I think that's illustrative of the shift yeah. that you're talking about. And, and we can try to diagnose exactly uh, what the reasons are, some of which we might get right, some of which we may not know. Um, so I think understanding that history, kind of the, the run-up from the 1990s through the 2000s, um, is, is really important if part of the goal is to recover some of those conditions that could lead to a, a more robust, um, localized, and compassion-driven agenda. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to my colleagues. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Christopher Fay, I just want to mention that uh, we met maybe originally two decades ago when Christopher was running a massive feed, what had been a massive feeding program at Broadway Presbyterian Church, which is about, what, 100th Street and Broadway in New York City. And Christopher was instrumental in transforming that to a program that was smaller but much more effective. Because as I understood, the massive feeding program, you know, great numbers, you can print in bulletins, all these people were feeding, but you're seeing the same people year after year after year after year. So how successful is it? And Chris changed it to a smaller program that actually helped people out of poverty Maybe you could talk about that a little bit and what you're currently doing and then discuss what we've just been talking about here. All right, I will do that. Um, so I am, I am someone who comes to this issue um, not as a policy analyst or even as someone who is really that um, conversed in policy. I had come in it as someone who tried to help homeless people get out of poverty and crisis and experimented first within inner city churches, uh, Marvin pointed out, called Broadway Presbyterian Church in New York, where a soup kitchen began and was serving about 300 to 300, 400 people a day. And, um, and yet, um, it was really helpers and helpies. It was so, that the people who were being served didn't know the names of those who were serving them, and the people who were serving them didn't know the names of those who were being served. And it was a very, uh, it was an exercise in um, feeling good about what we were doing and not an exercise in really making a difference in the lives of those who were being served. It's also an environment where the police were called all the time. There was a lot of discord, a lot, lot of um, um, antagonism. And um, I once actually had a moment of, uh, one of those little light bulb moments when no volunteer showed up and I went out on the street and there were 300 people waiting to be served. And I, th I said, can I have everyone's attention we need some volunteers. Are any of you be willing to come in and actually serve the others? So which of you homeless individuals would be willing to be a servant to the others? And the hands went up all along the row. And when they were traipsing in, um, I, I had to turn them off at some point, say, that, that's all I need, because there were so many who wanted to do it. And many of them said to me, I had never understood why you didn't ask us before. Basically, why didn't you ask us to be involved in the process of um, feeding ourselves. And so that became that light bulb moment and we turned it from a soup kitchen run by volunteers to a culinary arts program where the homeless people managed the program themselves, they managed the inventory, they, they cook the food, they serve the food, and then they would meet afterwards and talk about how their lives have been affected by this experience. And it suddenly became an extraordinarily successful program and people started getting off of drugs and we found ways to get them into jobs. Um, so that was, a, that was one of those moments where I realized that there was a secret to in fighting poverty, which was really the idea of empowerment. And people, in, uh, to empower someone means you have to have faith in their ability to do something for themselves and create a community in which that can occur. And uh, so we named our program Broadway Community. It was on Broadway, and the concept was people change within the context of community. And people have to have to change. This is another thing and that I firmly believe in it is the crux of what we do now. I run a program called Home Stretch. It's a program for homeless families. The difference between what I did in New York at that time was chronically homeless men and women, mostly single adults. Now I'm working with families with children, but some of the basic principles are the same, which is that they actually have to be involved in the process of changing their own lives. And what we do is to create an environment where that is most likely to occur. <coughs> It requires having faith in the individuals, that they have the ability, the capability within themselves, the resilience, the hope that you can capitalize on that and create a structure where uh, effort and achievement is rewarded. And uh, I'm proud to say, actually, we actually, last year we had uh, year-end results. These are all homeless families, again, that come from us referred by shelters. 91% of the families that exited our program moved into 
uh, housing that they can afford on the income they earn, 91%. And of those, 63% moved into market rate housing. Now in Fairfax County, if you know anything about that, the average apartment costs about 1800 a month for a family of four. The average income for a family when they come into the program is only minimum wage, part-time salary. That means that these families made tremendous changes in their own lives in order to move out of poverty. So what we're doing is actually very much in the vanguard. It's not what's happening in the field today. Um, because of government policy, uh, we feel very strongly that the much of the government policy around housing and homelessness right now is misguided. Uh, it's based on the supposition that people cannot and will not change, when we actually have the supposition that people can and want to change and will change given the right structure and opportunity. But we actually come to, when I was in New York, we took no government money in order to have the freedom to do it the way we thought was um, most effective. And when I first came to Homestretch, we did accept government money, and then government policy changed and came to a point where we realized that our r historically high results with client families would plummet if we continued to accept government money, and so we made the decision to go off of it. And that wasn't because of a, a political or philosophical decision about the role of government. It was based on a purely practical, pragmatic decision about what works, what is most effective to help a homeless family change the course of their life. Um, for instance, to, uh, just to, what's happening right now is startlingly, um, um, it, 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 we should all be upset by the process of what, what HUD is doing. If I were to accept any government money from Fairfax County, from the state of Virginia, from the um, Justice Department or directly from HUD. I could not require the families to do anything. I can't require someone who doesn't know English to learn English. I can't require a family to pay rent, contribute toward the cost of rent. I couldn't ask an able-bodied person to look for work. I could not ask them to save money. I could not ask someone who had an addiction to um, comply with some kind of um, addiction treatment. It's all considered putting a barrier in that path of that family to stay in the house. Furthermore, I would be required to give them short-term rental subsidies, so I couldn't work with them for much more than six or eight months. Um, now, this last year, the fact that 91% of the families leaving our program moved into market rate housing means that they, were, they, they made progress by being required to work, by required to go to school, by being required to learn English if they didn't know English being required to save money and to pay off debts and to reestablish credit. And all these things that we know are fundamental to a successful life. Um, but right now in this country, almost any program working with the homeless, if they want to access government funds, are required to do it that way. And in DC, the numbers of homeless families are exploding. I don't know how many of you are aware of this, and, but the District of Columbia has a terrible problem. Numbers of homeless families have increased ever since they started practicing this model. So we're trying to get the word out that this, this should be alarming to every American, what, no matter what political persuasion you come from. And getting back to, uh, I may be getting being off the topic, but for us, the most important thing is to pay attention to those people on the ground level who have found ways to really, that, that really work, that empower people to move out of their circumstances and not pity them. And, create environments in which they are um, encouraged to stay. I actually think right now in this country, many homeless, many, many very poor people are actually encouraged to become homeless because that's where they can get certain assistance. Um, I, we know of situations where, say, two sisters, both with three kids, both are working four part-time jobs. One loses her job and goes into the shelter and suddenly becomes eligible for a subsidy that she wasn't eligible before. Why shouldn't her sister who's in the same circumstance, just quit her job, go into the shelter and get that subsidy. It's r ridiculous. Um, we're not actually thinking about poverty from the point of view of the poor. Um, we have to be able to look at it in a reverse way, see what it's like to be poor, find, open those doors of opportunity for them, and that has to be done at the ground level by people who, would, who really understand what it's like to work with the poor and to be poor. And so I totally embrace what Marvin said about finding those, those uh, groups that are doing good work and trying to provide support to them. And one of the most important things we can do is shed light on them. 
Because if we, if we create systems that perpetuate people in poverty, what happens is the rest of us start thinking that people are consigned to poverty forever. We start to lose faith in humanity. We start to lose faith that people who are in those circumstances want to get out and have the means and hope to do it if they're just given the right structure and right support. It's nothing like seeing someone ascend out of poverty, the joy that that gives them, that sense of achievement. We have a woman now who is going about to graduate from Homestretch. She came in, she, she was sent to us by a shelter because they couldn't rapidly rehouse her because she had too many kids, she had five kids. She, her, her debt was too high, she had very few skills. She had a high school diploma but never did any college. And so no landlord would rent to her. So she was sent to us because she was considered a high needs client. Well, in two years, by working hard at all of these things, saving money, um, paying off her debts, she increased her credit score by 151 points. She has quadrupled her salary. She has, uh, uh, she's going to graduate by actually buying a home. So this is from homelessness to home ownership in about two and a half years. She did that because she was given the right structure and the right support to capitalize on her own strengths, and she did it using her own energy and her own talent. And for her, she will never be the same person again because she's proven to herself that she can be a remarkable and extraordinary human being. And I think of what her children see when they witness this. Her children who experienced poverty also watched their mother become a hero to them. They will probably never go through that kind of thing that, uh, again because they know what it's like to have determination. They've been witness to perseverance and to grit. So this is very exciting work for us to do this. And we feel like um, government needs to get out of the way, <laughs> needs to open pathways of opportunity for people. We need to find the organizations that are doing work, learn from them, celebrate them, and publish those results. Um, and we should stop HUD in its tracks right now. <laughs> I'll stop right there. Thanks. I, I admire Chris and everything you're striving to do. I also admire Angela. I've learned from her AEI papers, her analyses, and I admire that she's able to do that and also that she's not only authoring good papers like that, but has co-authored four children. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Um, well, thank you for uh, inviting me here, and, and thanks for, uh, um, or it's a pleasure to be with everybody. I, um, I, for the most part, started my career in 2002 uh, uh, working for the Human Resources Administration in New York City. So this was a time, this was um, as the mayoral administration was turning over from uh, Rudolph Giuliani to the Bloomberg years. Um, and as uh, many people know, uh, Mayor Giuliani had implemented welfare reform uh, in New York City. And so when I think of compassionate conservatism, uh, because of my time, uh, I ended up spending about 10 10, 12 years at HRA, um, it really comes from that perspective of working uh, directly with a welfare uh, agency administering a very large federal program uh, in terms of TANF, but with some local uh, flexibility. And it's why it's really a pleasure to be here with Dr. Olasky is because much of what you've talked about and much of what you've written about, I saw firsthand uh, with uh, individuals in New York City who were experiencing these programs and what these programs uh, were, were offering to them and also some of the negative consequences uh, of those programs. Uh, a couple, a couple uh, reactions or I guess a, a few things I wanted to, to mention is when I first uh, started working in 2002, it really was when welfare reform, uh, at least in New York City, it had been implemented for a couple years, but it was really get picking up steam. Um, the bureaucratic issues had been mostly figured out, and so participants were going through the program um, as they were intended to. Uh, compassionate conservatism to me is this uh, expectation that uh, government will provide assistance as long as there's some sense of personal responsibility from the recipient and they are contributing. What I learned in New York City is that that type of a social contract is very consistent with how poor people think. They also agree that in, in uh, receiving uh, any aid, whether from the government or anyone else, they want to have a contribution uh, in response to that. 
And so I think in that sense, um, just conservative principles in general were, had a very positive effect on welfare policy. Uh, and I saw it firsthand in New York City. What I think has happened since then in the 2000s um, is there's been a little bit of there's been a little bit of a move away from that in welfare policy for a variety of reasons. But another thing that happened is those principles were not present in our other safety net programs, and it wasn't always trickling down to what Dr. Alasky talked about to faith-based organizations, nonprofits, because of this bureaucratic system that we've been talking about was set up, a lot of those organizations didn't necessarily feel empowered to serve participants of these large uh, federal programs. So if you look at the data, you know, we saw, we see large um, uh, reductions in poverty, for example, after the reforms that were made in the late 1990s, but then since the early 2000s, we see somewhat of a, a, a stagnated, stagnation in terms of progress on poverty. Uh, and that, it doesn't matter how you measure it, whether it's consumption poverty, our AEI colleague Bruce Meyer measures poverty based on consumption. People measure it based on all resources in the household, government benefits everything. People measure it based on market income. No matter how you look at it, you see this trend of large reductions in poverty with either stagnation or slight increases in the 2000s. There's a lot of reasons for that, some of which we've heard today. Um, recession obviously plays a role, but I would also argue that not having these principles of compassionate conservative in the sense that you receive government aid, there are going to be some expectations on you, whether it's work, whether it's other contributions, it was limited to our cash welfare program. It was not expanded into other safety net programs like food assistance, Medicaid, housing. Those principles are really, are largely absent from those programs. Uh, and I think that that has contributed to uh, uh, some of the stagnation uh, that we have seen. So uh, hopefully we'll have a chance, a little bit of a chance to talk about where we see the future uh, of compassionate conservatism. I would say where we are right now is that we, I'm hopeful at least, or there, start to, there are some indications that we might be seeing a little bit of a resurgence. Potentially from the federal level, but where I'm seeing it more is from the state and local level. There are, and I, I do think states and uh, localities are in a better position to do the types of things that we're talking about for all the reasons we've talked about. They're just closer to populations, uh, they have more flexibility uh, to serve populations, and they have a better understanding of the issues that uh, families are experiencing in their communities. So to give you some examples where I see uh, some of these principles coming, uh, coming back into play is just the recent uh, waiver requests for the Medicaid program. A number of states have requested from the federal government that they're, they're allowed to implement its work requirements, but work requirements work requirements, but also just engagement requirements, uh, meaning it doesn't have to be work, it can be training, it can be, it's intended to be something, uh, so that people who are receiving public health insurance from the government, um, it's largely people who do not have children, um, but that they are giving something back, um, and then there, there is some expectation that is placed on them in order to receive public benefits. At this point, that is all wrapped up into this waiver process that is um, allowing states to experiment with some of these principles. And I think that, that that is where I'm hopeful that some of these things will continue to happen, not only in Medicaid, but in housing, HUD, in uh, our food, as food assistance programs. Um, and again, I think it's coming, though, from the states. Uh, and I think that the states are the ones that are going to be encouraged to, uh, to uh, have a resurgence of some of these principles uh, that we're talking about. So I'm just going to end there, because I know we're going to have a, a little bit of a conversation about maybe where we see the, the future or, or how we see the future in terms of some of these principles. Okay, do we go to questions at this point from the audience or what's your, what's your pleasure? Um, that's, certainly, that's certainly a good idea. Yeah, let's do it. Martin. Here you have a microphone coming to you. Uh, Martin Worcester Capital Research Center, who's been around so long that I provided research to Joseph Jacobs for the Compassionate Conservative. A uh, question for Mr. Fay. Okay. Uh, you talked about bad things government did. 
are there things that government can do that can help you other than removing stupid regulations like zoning requirement? I mean, is there anything or is it just what you described? Uh, what, you know, are there deregulatory steps that government can do that would help you? Uh, thank you. I, I may have come off as uh, far too um, uh, one-sided about my feelings. Uh, I, I clearly feel like HUD is doing something very misguided. And it's, uh, but I do not come from the perspective that government has no role to play in the alleviation of poverty. I believe that we should be looking at what works and supporting what works and doing the kinds of things where the which funneling money toward local organizations and supporting innovation. The, the problem I have generally with what happens with government bureaucracy is they tell you how to do everything and tie your hands so you, any kind of innovative approach um, tends to be um, impossible. So, you know, look at how the difference between a foundation, how a foundation supports a charitable organization and how a government does it. Foundations will come and visit you and look at what you do, and if they like what you do, they'll support you. Now, they might actually ask for more data. They might ask you to be more rigorous in your collection of, of metrics. They may try and help you grow and scale. They may do any number of things, but that's how a foundation approaches supporting charitable work. Um, it's not that way with government, generally. A government comes in, finds out whether you're doing it the way they want it to be done, and rank you accordingly. I'll give you one example of this that I thought was stunning. In Fairfax County, uh, a couple of years ago, when we were still receiving some money, we were part of a continuum of care, which is basically a group of organizations all receiving a single grant from HUD. We would, we would uh, we were participated in this continuum, and there were roughly 300 families being served. And that year, HUD required that you count whether any family had increased their income while receiving services. Now, it seems to me if you're going to be providing help for homeless families, one of the things that should be a good measure is whether their income increases. <clears throat> that should be fundamental. Well, that was part of what they were tracking, but it had no, uh, uh, it didn't matter in terms of scoring. Now, out of 300 families over the period of this grant, we had nine families. And nine families total during that period of the grant increased their income. So we had, of those nine families, eight were ours. So our rate of success was eight out of nine. Their rate of success was one out of 291. <coughs> Everyone else's success, rate of success. We got the lowest ranking of all the organizations because we had requirements. We required them to, to, to work, we required them to you know, go to learn English, et cetera, et cetera. So that said to me that fundamentally we're looking at the wrong thing. They were not actually looking at what is effective. They were looking at what is, who is following the rules. We should be always looking at what's, what is really effective and, and base the rules on what's effective, not the other way around. That's where I find the biggest problem with government bureaucracies. Not the fact, not, I, I would love to see government become involved in, in supporting more innovative solutions. I don't think we could, for instance, I don't think we can help the homeless without vouchers. There's a certain number of families that are always going to need to move into subsidized housing. Not everyone, but some will. So there are some things out there that only a government can, can do. I hope I answered your question. If I could follow up on that just real quickly, I know the question wasn't directed to me, but I think the, the lessons from welfare reform, from, from school choice, and, and uh, even now uh, these reforms to Medicaid, I think give, give some answer to the question. That I, th I think I, I'm of the view that our programs, our social welfare programs, should have clear objectives. I think you should be able to write those objectives on an index card and then you should the default mode should be to kind of radical flexibility at the local level and, and a willingness to live with uneven results uh, because of that the the work requirements and the time limitations that were a part of the 96 welfare reform are very straightforward and clear and like Angela said that only applied unfortunately to that one program and not to our other food assistance health insurance and other types of programs they were very clear and 
what happened as a result was the flexibility then that was given to states to, to, to meet those objectives of, of required work was um, local actors having to, to work together. I mean, county welfare agencies went from being essentially outposts of a federal bureaucracy processing checks and benefits to, to having to work with workforce development systems, local chambers of commerce and others to help people get into work. And that's, and, and that's a messy process and some states did it better than others and some cities did it better than other, others, but in general, the, the results were good. And I think with, with charter schooling, it's the same thing. The, the requirements and objectives for what it takes to set a charter, you have a government oversight body that approves that charter, but then you allow parents and, and teachers and others to, to run that school in accordance with the objectives that they've sent to the chartering authority. And, that, and there's a reason why I think that movement has, has exploded as well. And so I think the, the lessons you know, really flow from watching what succeeds at the local level, like what, what you're doing, Chris. I think you know, when you see what both Chris and Angela said is that low-income families want to improve their lives. They, they, they want to see things get better. And uh, you, you really need to allow the local actors that are working with them the flexibility to, to achieve that and not over stipulate it, which is unfortunately too often the case in what you're running into with, with, with HUD. So I think that kind of flexibility is a good thing. Seeing the, even though what, what uh, CMS right now, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, what they're doing to allow states to use work requirements as far as Medicaid reform goes, um, it, it's generally been off the radar screen. It hasn't gotten a ton of attention, but where the critics have been you know, picking up on it, it's this, this resistance to allowing states this flexibility. It's not even a, Right now, the administration is not even requiring states to do this. They're just allowing states to do this. And I think they have upwards of, I don't know if it's 15 now or so applications to, to do this or more, I'm not sure, um, where states say we want the flexibility to change the way that Medicaid works so that we can actually get families engaged, help them find work and, and the like. And so it's just, just getting to the point where we're able to allow that flexibility has been a huge, huge achievement. Um, uh, and unfortunately, there's a, a strong lobby of people that don't want to give states that flexibility. Yes, you sir, in the third row, yeah. Great, um, I guess I have a more of a political question here. I wonder if, because compassion conservatism relied on traditional strict conservative definitions of who counted as needy, support needs to be temporary, and so on and so forth, the movement failed to actually gain a sufficient political base among working class voters and lower middle class voters whose anxieties are clearly driving our discourse right now. So I guess to give an example, um, when Romney lost in 2012, the discourse among conservatives is that this shows that we need to start talking about the poor and the needs, and the needs of the poor. But if you actually look at the exit polling, what people said is that it's not so much that they were rejecting Romney because he didn't care about people in general, it's because he didn't care about people like them. So I guess my question would be, um, can compassion conservatism be a viable, viable political ideology without kind of expanding the focus of need to broader sections of the income base? Well, it's a, it's a really good question. The, I don't think the, the I, I would like to think at least that the concern is not just why, uh, why, how come I'm not getting my piece of the action. I think the concern more often is when people like me are getting their piece of the action but they don't really need it, then the sense is they're stealing from me. When people who really need it get it, I don't think we get that same reaction. So it's a different conception of who really needs it and who doesn't need it. So I think that actually can play if you're careful to make the point of distinguishing between those who are really needy and those who aren't. And the problem with a lot of programs is they're not. That discourages a whole bunch of people discourages the people who are really striving through their own efforts to come out of poverty because they say, why should I do all this work if other people without doing it can get it the same? And then it also discourages all these other voters you referred to who just see it as unfair. So if, if, uh, if other people aren't getting what's perceived as unfair, I don't think you're going to have that reaction against it. After all, we don't in our own neighborhoods, I mean, if we know someone who is disabled and can't work, we don't expect that person to work. The concern we have often is if a person could work perfectly well and doesn't want to. And I think that's what leads to the political problems. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, when um, I, I was I advising Mike Pence when he was governor of Indiana and we applied for one of these waivers at Medicaid and we wanted to change Indiana's Medicaid program into a complete consumer-driven healthcare 
plan where everyone had a health savings account and had preventative services paid for. And we were, our proposal was based on a pilot project with about 45,000 Medicaid recipients that Mitch Daniels had started before Pence was, was governor. And it took us 18 months of negotiations with the Obama administration just to allow those provisions to be accepted as part of our waiver. And, and the thing that we kept coming back to them with, it, it, requiring someone to put a dollar or two a month into a savings account was kind of a bridge too, too far. It was like something that was being done to people that would be really hard when you're, when you're living in poverty. And we kept showing them that our survey data showed that 98% of the people who had formerly been on Medicaid who are part of this pilot program wanted to stay in the pilot program and not go back to Medicaid. There was buy-in from the recipients. It's actually a better program. They had, preventive, they had free preventive care. They had choice that they could use those dollars for, that the state, the state put most of the majority into the health savings accounts. But they learned what it was like to actually start thinking about their health in, in new ways and to, and to pursue health care in the way that, that people who have more money have the luxury of, or at least the ability to do. And, um, and that, that, in the end, became sort of the, the point that was hard to argue with, was that the recipients themselves were bought into this. And I think you find the very same thing with, with the charter school movement. When, when it first w was introduced state by state, it was controversial. But you go to, go to any charter school now and, and look at the, 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 the makeup of the people on the board and the children in the school, and it's going to be very diverse politically. It's going to be, you know, people are going to defend that school that their, their kids go to. Look what's happened here in Washington, D.C. since charters were introduced. The public schools have gotten better. The charters have gotten better. Lots of kids are in them. It's a, it's a much more vibrant environment with lots of buy-in. And I think there are, and, and we could go on down the road even through what happened uh, in the welfare reform era when it felt like we were doing something to people, but then when people got the experience of getting introduced to employers with training providers that could give them the skills that they needed to actually work and find dignity in their work and take care of their kids that way, people are bought into the program. And so I think the lesson is that you always have to be working at the level of the person whose needs are, 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 are foremost. And if, and, if, and if public policy is formulated that way, and if people are running for public office, actually spend time with people who are in these programs, will actually um, perhaps be more authentic in their claims and, and their ideas will, 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 will create greater buy-in in the future. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, John Soliday, I'm an economist. I have a question, particularly, well, particularly for everybody, but um, it's the role of religion itself on the part of the recipient as to whether or not it'll, the program will be more effective. Because I hear you know, a lot of secular uh, solutions. But I, I just wonder if, and not just faith, general, but religious faith, um, how important that is in getting these programs to work, particularly since the government precludes it. Well, I <laughs> I can just tell you this goes back to about 1990 when Deborah Norville was the hostess on the Today Show. Some of you may remember that. And she wasn't the, the brightest person around in interviewing, but she once had four people who were, had all been drug addicts and no longer were. And she asked the first, well, how did you, how did you come out of drugs? And he says something like, praise Jesus, you know, and goes on from there. And she asked the second, and he says the same. And the third, it's also pretty similar. And again, this is, I think, the common experience of what happens. People need to go through a spiritual transformation of some sort to come out of something so dire. And finally, Deborah Norville asked the fourth, well, apart from religion, what changed you? So, I mean, that's, that's the way, that, that's what I've, I've heard in, in 25 years going all over. Now, if you look at, uh, there, there, are, there are different religions that may work in different ways, but in some way, it's a question not just of physical things, not just of money or anything like that. It's a question of worldview, which comes out of religion, and what's important and what's not. And that's what, that's what changes people. It's, a, it's, it's something that a lot of secularists don't like to consider, but I think that's, that's the historical reality. I'd like to comment on that, too. Um, Homestretch right now, the program I'm running now, is, is ostensibly a nonpartisan, nonsectarian organization it happens to be staffed by a whole bunch of Christians. So it is our faith that dictates how we do things and the approach we take. And the other thing I want to say is the faith of the individuals that come into the program is usually the thing that we build upon to, for them to find their hope and their inner strength. So it's, it's a faith of the giver and it's a faith of the one who is receiving that's it's critical to it. Um, and we have people of all faiths come into our program but that same principle applies. Um, they rely on that and we capitalize on that. We build upon that 
because it is, it is the worldview and it's our sense of values and our sense of self-worth all come from our spiritual spirituality. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Jill Turgeon, I serve in the Loudoun County School Board. Probably wondering what a school board member is doing here. Um, Professor Alaska, you talked about decentralization, and, and I think you were primarily referring to like the economic policy and so forth. I think really the underlying problem that I am seeing, and this r runs across education and, and social issues and so forth, is, is a decentralization of, or what needs to happen is a decentralization mindset, uh, of a sense of personal responsibility and empowerment. Um, and I see this again across education choice and, and so forth. And one of the problems, again, you know, we're here talking about policy and we're here at AEI and it's great, but the, the, the thing that's only, gonna, the only thing that's gonna make an impact is when we get the message out to the public. And I think the, 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 the left does this much better than the right. Um, you, we just had a big rally here in DC um, on issues that seemed like these individuals had this empowerment and a personal message, but it really had nothing to do with the empowerment they as individuals, they were asking the government to do more. So I think what we need to see happening is more empowerment on an individual level. And again, it would go across all sorts of, of, of arenas. If we were, well, what can we do? How can we get that message out there? Where can we start? We're not going to have rallies on personal empowerment, I don't know, but, but what can we do to get that out into the public and to, to get people rallied around this idea of we have the empowerment, as uh, Mr. Fay said, with the programs that, that he has implemented in Fairfax? Well, as an, as an editor, I think of journalism and, and having people who actually go out into, into parts of the community which aren't, off the tourist, aren't on the tourist guide programs and, and find out about these. Again, uh, Hannah Hawkins, I think, was one of the, was one of the largely unknown uh, great resources of Washington, D.C. And she didn't get much, much publicity. She just kept doing it year after year. And I know people like that all over the place. I mean, how, have you, how many of you before today had, had heard of Christopher Fay? And yet he's been doing this for a long, long time. So I see this as a journalistic responsibility to not just go and sit around and get a press release from someone or have a public relations person tell you something and just relay it or be a propagandist for a political party, but actually go out into cities and ask around who's doing a real good job and go and report and tell those stories. Again, we try to do this in world and and our Hope Award stories are some of our best read stories because people want to know, they trust us that we're actually not just going to do something that's not true, but here's a real account. And I think that type of stuff makes a huge difference. I do think it's important for our public leaders to talk about these things more. I mean, I, yeah. I think, you know, there, there was, we, we had a lot of public leaders really on the right and the left in the 1990s talking about localized solutions in, in many of these issue areas that we're talking about. It wasn't just, it wasn't just conservatives. It was on both sides. And I think um, to the extent that um, Republicans and conservatives have sort of neglected these themes of late. I mentioned the 2010 Tea Party election as, as an example. Um, uh, the election of Donald Trump has, has caused progressives to wake up to the realities of federalism again. And we, we just uh, put out a, a collection of essays two months ago here at AEI on localism, restoring localism in America, and it's got a fairly balanced set of contributors from both the right and the left, kind of this sense that we're where for whatever reason we've become so polarized um, in recent years and, and decades, um, it seems like we're obsessed with the national conversation. We're always having national conversations and shouting matches on cable TV and in social media. And um, we don't give a lot of airtime to what's actually happening on the ground. And I share Angela's optimism. There's a lot of experimentation going on at cities and, and state levels right now, but we don't, we're not really hearing about it. And, and so I, I think we kind of have to deal with the reality that it is. We do, for whatever reason, seem to be obsessed with people who are in the national spotlight. And so I think we need to um, hold those people accountable. Our own representatives, um, journalists can do this as well, hold these people accountable to talking about the way that policy can actually be driven um, by local actors and, and, and perfected by local actors. Yeah, I'll tell you one funny story. This is back in 1995 when uh, Newt Gingrich had read a book referred to of mine, uh, The Tragedy of American Compassion, was telling all the freshman representatives at that point to come read it. So I was, uh, gave a talk to about, about 30 of them and was explaining things, and I saw some nodding heads and not nodding off to sleep, but actually nodding in agreement. And uh, I lost them, though, when, I, when one asked, well, what practically should I do? And I said, well, you should actually go and volunteer at a charity in your district and go there and, and don't go there with press 
you know, maybe after a few months you could, you could have a report, but just go there and learn about it, and then you'll be able to talk about it. And they all said, no, we don't have time for that. You know, they, they had time to consult pollsters, but not to do that. <laughs> Uh, Stanley Carlson T's Institutional Religious Freedom Alliance. I was in the Bush faith-based office at the beginning. Um, you know, one thing that you mentioned that, that kind of worked was TANF and welfare reform came out of a lot of discussion that wasn't just in think tanks or the media, thanks for the work you do, uh, Marvin, but among members of Congress and policy people generally. And so they crafted legislation that made it possible and even imperative that these kind of principles be uh, implemented at the state and local level. And that didn't happen across these other programs. And so the faith-based office had just marginal things that it could do. Um, access to recovery was a great idea. It came out of the administration. But then states revolted against it. They wanted all that money reprogrammed into the regular programs. So I think one of our big problems is that on Capitol Hill, the debate has become less government, more government, and not civil society, different ways of approaching things. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. You should great. be up here, Stanley, not me. Huh? That's right. Hello, by the way. It's been, a long, it's been a long time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Do we have time for one more? Do we have one more hand up? Yeah. I thought I saw it. Yeah, we've got a hand right here, Brian. Hey, uh, Brian Noyes. Um, I really appreciate the examples you all gave along the way of where uh, what you did in Indianapolis, which, you know, the, the compassion, um, the, the conservative, uh, sorry, uh, as, as all these things are being said at local level, there was somewhere along the way where they got a national voice. Um, the, the, uh, the contract with America, you know, Bush, is there somebody that's got a national voice now that is carrying some of these local examples and bringing them forward? I mean, Speaker Ryan does like to talk about these issues, um, and he has for a number of years. Uh, I think maybe given that he took up the speakership, it's <laughs> it's not quite it's not quite as good of a fit anymore, um, but he, you know, he put on a poverty conference during the election. He's always kind of talking about these issues. So I don't know if he can still be the champion given the role he plays now, but um, I would say that he is one person. The other two people I would mention is uh, Senator Tim Scott and Rubio, Senator Rubio in the Senate, um, who also have really sort of uh, started talking about these issues and, and seemed to show a genuine uh, interest in kind of reviving discussions. Uh, many of the discussions we're having today, but reviving these discussions among their colleagues, which, like you said, is really important because that that it's that discussion at the national level uh, is ultimately what drives a lot of what happens at the state and local level. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, in some ways, we've seen the ascent in recent years of what I suppose could be called callous conservatism rather than compassionate conservatism. And it's hard to turn that around, but I think I, I, I have hope that it will be. I, I think America is, is waiting for people who can actually give a message of hope and not a message of fear. We'll see. And I would say, and, and I, those are the first three names I thought of too that Angela mm -hmm. mentioned. I would say at the state level, um, and you have governors like Doug Ducey in, in Arizona and, and um, uh, you, you know, even even John Hickenlooper in Colorado has talked about some of these themes. I find Ducey, particularly, if you go back and read like a State of the State address, his last one that he gave, it's it's completely filled with this this, this language instead of objectives. Um, I think someone like Eric Holcomb in Indiana, who's a mm -hmm. protege of, of Mitch Daniels, falls into this camp. So I think I think there are there are emerging leaders in in, in governors' uh, offices and in state houses as well. That that you know, when we fast forward, we have this conversation in another ten years. We'll point back to them and say that they they kind of led the next kind of revival. Amen. Looking at the clock, I think we're done. Thank you all for being at AEI today. Thank it's you. been a pleasure to have you. Thanks very much.